Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a new series entitled Managing for the Master Till He Comes. And this is lesson number one in that series for January 7 of 2023, entitled Part of God's Family. Part of God's Family, Managing for the Master? Hmm. That sounds like some kind of a financial thing or something. Well, let's jump in and see. Is Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the many ways in which you guide us and direct us and keep us in health. There's so many ways in which we depend upon you. And now we're going to talk about ways in which we might be able to be partners with you. May it be true is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin this new series on stewardship, that's kind of an old word, isn't it? Consider this from the Bible Study Guide. Jim? As Christians, an amazing feature about our relationship with God is that He trusts us to manage His affairs on the earth. At the very outset of human history, God explicitly delegated to Adam and Eve the personal care of a flawless creation. See Genesis uh, 2, 7 to 9 and 15. From the naming of the animals he, to keeping the garden and to f filling the earth with children, God let it be known that we are to work on his behalf here. He also mm. blesses us with resources, but we are the ones whom he has entrusted to manage them, such as to collect money to write the checks, to do the electronic transfers, to make the budgets, or to bring our tithes and offerings to the church on the Sabbath mornings. God encourages us to spend the resources that He has given to us for our own needs, for the need of others, and for the advancement of His work. Incredible as, that, as it may seem, we are the ones whom God has entrusted with raising His children, building His buildings, and educating the succeeding generations. This is from the Bible Study Guide for December 31. Okay, now, my question before we go on. If you were God, would you trust you with raising his children? <laughs> Don't answer that question. <laughs> if well, we're all Genesis. his children, aren't, aren't yeah, we? Yeah. So, actually, we've been raised by somebody, too. Yeah. So. The only way God can deal with finite beings is to let finite beings deal well, we with We are unique. So. There's never been another group like us, and we produce our, we make our own decisions about reproducing and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of scary. Maybe it's a good thing we're unique. Yeah. There are many passages in Scripture suggesting that we are part of God's family. We are to refer to the God of heaven as our Father. You remember the Lord's Prayer? and the Lord Jesus Christ as our brother. We are to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And you know those passages, Matthew 6 and Luke 11. In many places, Jesus referred to God the Father as his Father and then our Father. Uh, see, for example, John 20, 17. Ellen White had some things to say about that as well. Carrie? <clears throat> Notice these words from Ellen White. From that scene of heavenly joy, there comes back to us on earth the echo of Christ's own wonderful words, I ascend unto my, my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. It's John 20, 17. The family of heaven and the family of the earth are one. For us our Lord ascended and for us he lives. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And that's from Desire of Ages, page 835, paragraph 2. From Mrs. And she White. quoted a couple of passages there, John 20, 17 and Hebrews 7, 25. The history of the children of Israel in relationship to Pharaoh and the kingdom of Egypt reminds us that God regarded the children of Israel as his own people. There's a, lot, a number of places that refer to that. Exodus 3.10, Exodus 5.3, and all the way over the New Testament, Galatians 3.26 and 29. And in 29, as you remember in the New Testament, when, God, when Jesus uh, found out that the children of Israel had rejected him, he includes all of us as 
children of Abraham. The best human example that God can give of the kind of love he expresses toward us is a family where relationships are very good and love is an exercise between members. God shows his love toward us as family members are supposed to love each other. Can you imagine a world in which everyone is treated as a brother or sister? And I'm not talking about sibling rivalry here. I'm talking about <laughs> loving brothers and sisters. Wouldn't that be something? I mean, we have nations that can't, I mean, whole nations that can't manage to keep get along. Remember that we hope to be a part of the family of God that ascends to heaven where we will be living with people from all cultures and all generations since the time of Adam and Eve. We need to learn to get along with people who may not think exactly as we do. And here's a question that puzzles a lot of people. What language will we speak in heaven? Obviously English. Obviously English. <laughs> <laughs> the, That's a joke. The people in uh, the southern part of America are sure that it's Spanish, of course, or maybe Portuguese. So how, how should we relate to the things that God has given us? Psalms 50, 10 through 12. The Lord says, All the animals in the forest are mine, and the cattle on thousands of hills. All the wild birds are mine, and all the living things in the fields. If I were hungry, I would not ask for you for food, for the world and everything in it is mine. From the Good News Bible. Okay. And you might add to that? Uh... Sure. First Chronicles 29, 13, and 14. Praising God, King David said, Now, our God, we give you thanks, and we praise your glorious name. Yet my people and I cannot really give you anything, because everything is a gift from you, and we have only given back what is yours already. Again, good news, by Remember that there in First Chronicles 29, David asked God if he could build the temple in Jerusalem. And God says, no, you have killed too many people. You've, you're, you've been a man of war. I don't want you to build, but your son will be more a man of peace. I want him to build the temple. So David said, can I have permission to gather the, the building materials? And God said, yes, I think that's a good idea. Some people have suggested, and I, I'm sure this is, it can't be true, but it, this is what some have suggested, that there was more gold and silver gathered for that temple than there is in the whole world today. I, I think of the way gold and silver is being mined and so forth. There must be more than there were, but more than there was at that time. But anyway, Haggai 2 verse 8. The Lord says, all the silver and gold of the world is mine. Good News Bible. Okay. King David wanted to build a temple for God, but in essence, God said, no, you spent too much of your lifetime in war and killing people. Your son will build a temple. Then David asked him. He's if, such a better person. He's, he's only going to have a thousand wives. Yeah, and, right. And con concubines and. And build a whole lot of pagan temples on top uh, of Mount Olives and so forth like that. Offer his son as a sacrifice. So why do you suppose God made that, said that and, and gave that information? made that condition to David. David, to us, seems more a man of God than Solomon, but we believe that both of them will be in heaven. Well, so they have, um, wasn't David supposed to be a man after his own heart? Well, that, so, was, that, was, in his, that was when he was very young. That, that was the time well, he was... You don't think God would look into the future and well, see that? Is, yeah. it, is it all conditional up to a point and stops? Another way of reading does something that is, wrong? Yeah. Another way of reading that is it's, it's a, a God exercised his prerogative to cho choose uh, David. It yeah. is, it, 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 we might be reading too much uh, into what that means, a man actor. It's just, oh. it's, it, God exercised. He, the kings did that with their vassals. They chose their vassal. That's, it comes from that same phrase. So, um, but what God is saying there basically is, I choose David over Saul. There you go. That's the better way. We don't have to read too much into <laughs> yeah. David's character. David concluded by saying, in essence, we really cannot take any credit for all these special materials because we are just giving you back 
your own stuff. If God had not chosen to bless us, we would have nothing to give back. In fact, we would not even exist. God created us. You know the story of Genesis 1 and 2. Christ and the Father in cooperation made everything. Gary? Uh, I oh, I'm sorry. No, Myra. You're skipping me. Sorry. John 1, 3. Through him, God made all things. Not one thing in all of creation was made without him. Good News Bible. And in Psalms 33, 6 and 9, the Lord created the heavens by his command, the sun, the moon, the stars by his spoken word. When he spoke, the world was created. At his command, everything appeared. Good News Bible. And you probably all are aware that uh, we have gotten some interesting pictures back from the new Webb telescope. And uh, they were, you know, the purpose of building the Webb telescope, they were going to go look all the way back to 14.8 billion years, I think it is, and they were going to see the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And when they looked back to see the Big Bang, they found out that there's a whole lot more stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, a lot of evolutionists are trying to say, well, we'll push the Big Bang back. They thought they had it all worked out, had it calculated accurately. We'll push it back a little bit more. I, That's not going to solve the problem. I attended a supposed scientific session online recently, and it was talking about, no, I won't say what it was talking about, but there was a session on evolution. Mm -hmm. And you know, here's what happened 50, 15 billion years ago, and here's what it is now, and so on. Yeah. And they throw those billions and millions of years around. It's just we were there. Yeah, it's just uh, amazing well, about people think, believe. You think God could hold billions and billions of years if He had to? <laughs> well, no problem for him. The infinite. Well, I mean, what, what do we know about the infinite? Yeah. Only what is revealed. So. So, what is the most important thing that God has given us? Without a doubt, His greatest gift to His children was His Son Jesus Christ. Think of all the blessings that have come to us through the life and death of Jesus. Okay, Gary, you want to try that one? Okay. From the Bible Study Guide, BSG, salvation then is the foundation gift because without his, this gift, what else could we get from God that in the long run would really matter? Whatever we might have here... One day we will see, we will be dead and gone, and so, so will everyone who ever remembered us. And whatever good we did, we will, will be forgotten as well. First and foremost, then, we must always keep the gift of the gospel, that is, Christ in Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2 2, at the center of all our thoughts. Thank you. Very good. Hi, that's from our Bible study guide. We're going to come in some of the future lessons, and one so called one atheist said, We're just a bunch of rotting flesh hanging on deteriorating bones. Doesn't that sound exciting? <laughs> little ray of sunshine he had there, right? <laughs> rotting hunks of flesh, I think is the actual words he is. Rotting hunks of flesh on deteriorating bones. I mean, you know, if, there's, if you have no plan for any hope of beyond this life, I mean, what else can you say? Why do you think Paul made the following statement, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, that Gary referred to? For while I was with you, I made up my mind to forget everything except Jesus Christ and especially his death on the cross. And what did Jesus mean when he said the following? Jim? First Corinthians. No, Matthew. No, excuse me. Matthew 6, 33. Instead of be concerned about everything else with the kingdom of God and with, me, and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all of these things. Good news, Bible. Okay, we need to remember that God not only created us, but also He sustains us in our daily needs. Carrie, you got a couple of 
passages for that. Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. It's from the Good News Bible. Psalm 37, 25. I am old now. I have lived a long time, but I have never seen good people abandoned by the Lord or their children begging for food. Good News Bible again. Philippians 4.19, And with all his abundant wealth through Christ Jesus, my God will supply all your needs. Good News Bible. Okay, so that means we shouldn't have to do anything. God will just take care of us, right? Is that what it means? Not really, I don't think. If actually, we, work. we act out, we actually are God in action. We are supposed to be acting on his behalf, is mm -hmm. what you're saying. Go ahead, Gordon. Yeah, if we work at it, we can, uh, we can do what, uh, what he's looking for, maybe. Jesus went beyond giving himself. When he was preparing to leave his disciples, he promised to send the Comforter known as the Holy Spirit. John 14, verses 15 through 17 from the Good News Bible. If you love me, you will keep... You will obey my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. He is the Spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive him because it cannot see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and is in you. I'm currently uh, listening to a book, actually, a very interesting book, and they're having an argument about whether anything that you can't see or feel or hear is real. And that's quite a, quite a, a, a challenge to, to work out. So are and, atoms real? Well, that's one of the things they got down to. Electrons? Yeah, electrons, molecules. X-rays? X-rays, yeah. Each of us should recognize that keeping God's commandments, and, and I should say they went back to the place where, back to history, and said, and how did people decide this? Well, this guy said, there's hydrogen and there's oxygen. Okay, but they make water. Well, how do you know that? Well, he actually isolated some hydrogen and oxygen. He says it takes two hydrogens to make, and one oxygen to make water. He, de he had determined that. So he took twice as much hydrogen, hydrogen and he burned it with half as much oxygen and produced some water and it was all gone and that was his proof that these <laughs> this is very simple but that was I think 1650 or something like that very simple experiment each of us should recognize that keeping God's commandments is the right thing to do the work of the Holy Spirit is to lead us to understand and appreciate the truth about God not only has God given us life and health, but he also distributes to us certain spiritual gifts to be used for the benefit of the church here on earth. Myra? 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 11. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives the ability to all for their particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in, the in some way in each person for the good of all. The Spirit gives one person a message full of wisdom, while another person, the same Spirit, gives a message of full knowledge. One and the same Spirit gives faith to one person, while another person, he gives the power to heal. The Spirit gives one person the power to work miracles, to another the gift of speaking God's message, and yet to another the ability to tell the difference between the gifts that come from the Spirit and those that do not. One person gives to to one person he gives the ability to speak in strange tongues, and to another he gives the ability to explain what is said. But it is one and the same Spirit who does all of this. As He wishes, He gives a different gift to each person from the Good News Bible. Okay, now let's think about this. 
if we had any one of those things by itself, we'd have a pretty limited program, wouldn't we? So what is God saying here in this verse if we had time to read the whole chapter and, 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 and fit, fit it into the rest of Ephesians? Paul is specifically saying we each have different, ta we're different people. We each, ha we each have different, ta you know, yes. talents and so forth and gifts. But if we put them all together, we can have a perfect whole. And that's what he's trying to, point he's trying to make here. Okay? Uh, the Bible study guide then goes on to say, in short, the God to whom we live, we move, and have our being, from Acts 17, 28, the God who gives all life, breath, and all things, this is from Acts 17, 25, has given us existence, the promise of salvation, material blessings, and the spiritual gifts in order to be a blessing to others. Again, whatever material possessions we, that we have, whatever gifts or talents that we have been blessed with, we are indebted in every way to the giver in how we use those gifts. That's okay. from Tuesday, January 3, Bible Study Guide. Okay. From Ellen G. White, she says, Parents in wisdom and love teach their children the grand lesson that in God we live and move and have our being. Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. I love that text. Wow. Isn't that you, a... re you read that a lot, and I, I love that. That's December 2, and of course, 1890. It's, yeah. That's not saying that God is sitting there and boom, boom, boom. What it means is that God arranges everything, and it all works right, so that it keeps working. The, the, heart, the heart keeps beating. Um, and more importantly, the brain keeps working. Yes, more importantly, the brain. Although you wouldn't be very far without the heart. That's right. Nor would, you wouldn't be anywhere without the brain. You wouldn't be anywhere without the brain, so there you go. Wouldn't be anywhere without the heart. Or... God has given us so much. Does he expect any response on our part? Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. Gary? Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Good news Bible. That's Jesus' favorite commandment. Yeah, he's going to say that in just a moment now. Jesus answered. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus answered. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Good news Bible. Uh, Bible study guide. How how would you love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might? Matthew twenty two thirty seven King James Version. Interestingly enough, the Bible gives us the answer, and it's not what most people expect. Now that's from well, our Bible study guide for Wednesday, January four. Reading, January, reading Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 13, and 1 John 5, 3, biblically speaking, what is our proper response in our love relationship with our Father in heaven? Well, first of all, what Moses said to the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 13, now people of Israel, listen to what the Lord your God demands of you. Worship the Lord and do all that he commands. Love him, serve him with all your heart, obey all his laws. I am giving, you, uh, giving them to you today for your benefit. Even in the New Testament, near the end of John's life, he wrote, 1 John 5, 3, For our love for God means that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not too hard for us. So, is keeping God's commandments too big of a burden? Too difficult? Or is it for our best good? Is trying to keep the commandments, especially the fourth commandment, just a proof of legalism? Do we need to take God's commands seriously? Look at what Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount. Jim? Well, how do you, how yeah. do you fulfill that commandment? What's that? Which commandment? This, it, it, this commandment to love well, they're Well, they're going to try to explain that in just a moment. Let's okay. see what you think. Matthew 7, verses 21 to 27. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. When judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. Let me interrupt there for a moment. If someone performs a so-called miracle in God's name, is the devil helping them do that? If they're not true people, if God says, I, I never knew you? Satan has a lot of power. <laughs> so, yeah, and it and says... He can create diseases and what have you, so... And uh, elsewhere in the New, Te New Testament, it says clearly that he has the power to work miracles. Yeah. So some people might actually be so working, doing so-called miracles in God's name when in actual fact it's the devil. You think that God allows the devil to do that? Sure. Why not? I just want God to hear you say it. <laughs> God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. That's a great phrase to help deal with problems in the Bible. You don't have to attribute everything. God, if you analyze it, human nature is so evil, God doesn't have to lift a finger except to protect some. Otherwise, the whole th the thing would collapse. Yeah. Okay, you can go ahead. Was I too far off? Was, no, was that's that? okay. Verse okay. 24. Okay, so then, anyone who hears these words of mine and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The brain poured down, the water overflowed, and the wind blew hard against the, that house. But it, is not, but it did not fall because it was built on a rock. It was built on rock, excuse me. Mm -hmm. But anyone who hears these words of mine and does not obey them, you could say does not listen, to them uh, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Every rain, excuse me, the rain poured down and the rivers overflowed. The wind blew against hard against the house and it fell. And w what a terrible fall that was. Good News Bible. It's interesting that uh, some archaeologists are digging around the Sea of Galilee upon the north end and they believe they have discovered the correct site for the town of Bethsaida. Who came from Bethsaida? Peter, Andrew, and Philip, originally. Now later, uh, Peter and Andrew were living in Capernaum, but their, their hometown was this place. And the reason that, that, I, that came up right now is because they're discovering that there are some houses there built on solid rock. <laughs> So, I mean, that's, I'm just, you know, they're talking about here, this is, this is a real thing, you know. They were, There's also a Bethlehem up in that general area. Uh, yes, I think there is. Bethlehem of Galilee, something yeah, like that, something yeah. Like that, yeah. Does keeping God's commandments actually reveal our love for Him? What happens when we disobey God's commandments? Disobeying God's laws and rebelling against His government is what Lucifer Satan did. Do we, want to, do we want to be like him? God only asks us to do what in the end is the best thing for us to do. Even the terrible story of Job ended up being a great blessing for the entire onlooking universe. And I hope that when Job gets to heaven, the whole universe will have a, a celebration of Job. I mean, think of what he did. And also for all of us who understand the story in, the, in its completeness. It was a great defeat for Satan and a victory for God. So what about? Do you think they'll give him a standing ovation when he comes? I think they'll sing. They'll they'll sing him a eighteen part song or I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, a standing ovation and a hooray and a hallelujah. Maybe a hallelujah. How's that sound? Am I Job? Yeah. 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 Man, he deserves it. But I. It still hasn't really answered my question. Yeah. How do you love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength? Well, the first step strength. they're going to they're going to say is keep His commandments. But we're, we're going to go on. There, there's more. Keep his commandments. What does that mean? Being focused, maybe. Listen. Yeah. It would be. It would. I would. Simpli to simplify it is, all God has asked is a person to listen, right? 
pay attention. It doesn't no. mean it doesn't mean just let the it, let it go in one ear and out the other. You t- when you really say li- listening, that's your, your yeah. mind someplace else. Yeah, that, that, that would be with your whole whole heart. Your what, heart is where you do your thinking, right? Right. That's so, what. Uh, uh, so, so what about things like money? How does God expect us to deal with those things? Where are we? Carry, I believe. Matthew six nineteen through twenty one. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The New King James Version. And again, I'm reminded of something on news just recently. A huge high school with seven uh, active uh, security guards on duty, a young man managed to break in, and they still haven't figured out for sure how he managed to break into that building and shot two people and injured seven others. Yeah. I mean, you know. That was today? Yeah, well, it was reported. I don't know exactly. It was reported. Recently. Yeah, recently. Yeah. You know, uh, b- b- back to Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but they, so forth. You know, uh, nowadays, they, you know, for years, they, now they've been peddling, uh, um, getting food, st- store up food for, uh, yeah. for, for, and of course the Mormons have been big um, on that for yeah. generations. But um, <laughs> where, 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 did, where does, I think that Ellen White has some counsel on that, on that subject, mm-hmm. didn't she? She said, if you store it up, someone will take it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's all. Today we have been living among us on this. We have living among us. By the us. way, on, on that issue, he says, our, the, the prayer, ask for your daily bread. Yeah. Didn't say... Uh, 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 ask for a month's supply. Yeah. <laughs> Today we, how, how about a year's supply? Yeah. Today we have living among us on this earth a number of people who have amassed great wealth, and we know about those people. They're in the news all the time. When they die, what happens to that wealth? People just fight over it. That does not mean that it is wrong to be wealthy. However, the Bible makes it very clear that what we are supposed to, what we are supposed to do with our wealth. Gordon? Um, Ellen White from Christ's Object Lessons, page 351. Money has great value because it can do great good. In the hands of God's children, it is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty and clothing for the naked. It is a defense for the oppressed and a means of help to the sick. But money is of no more value than sand. Only as it is put to use in providing for the necessities of life, in blessing others and advancing the cause of Christ. Okay, so three, three purposes here. Gary, this is one of the ideas, what we're supposed to do in obeying God and so forth. Provide for the necessities of life, bless others, advance the cause of Christ. That well, looks like actions, but when you yeah. talk about love, yeah. Well, this is how this is what love does. Love does it. Mm-hmm. Love does. Okay. Love works. But if you works. if you just do it, does that mean that you love it? Loving. Well, I, I mean, obviously, people could do things for other motive, have it with other motives, and that's. That's obviously a, a problem. Jesus had some challenging words for us. How do you understand these words of him? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Ira, this Matthew from, 6. Okay. Steps to Christ, page 21. It's from Matthew 6, 21. First. Oh, first. I'm sorry. I skipped over that. Matthew 6, 21. For your heart will always be where your riches are. And then Ellen White, go ahead. Yes. Then Ellen White, I wanted that to sink in a little bit because I think that is what Gary's getting at in his uh, quest quest for that answer. Okay, from uh, Steps to Christ. The heart of God yearns over his earthly children with a love stronger than death. In giving up his son, he has poured out to us all heaven, us all heaven in one gift the Savior's life and death and intercession, the ministry of angels, the pleading of the Spirit, the Father working above, and 
Through all, the unceasing interest of heavenly beings, all are enlisted in, the, in behalf of man's redemption. Whoa. Thank you very much. Um, Gary, you want to take on that next paragraph there? Yes. If you have renounced self and given yourself to Christ, you are a member of the family of God and everything in the Father's house is for you. All the treasures of God are open to you, both the world that it now is and that which is to come. The ministry of angels, the gift of his spirit, the labors of his servants are all for you. The world with everything in it is yours so far as it can do you good. It's from Mrs. White, Thoughts from the Mount of, Mount of Blessing. Didn't know you owned the whole world, did you? <laughs> so long as it can do you good. Have you ever tried to sit down and make a list of all the benefits that you get on a regular basis from God? There are many passages in Scripture that talk about how God sustains us on a daily basis. For example, see, and we don't have time to look at these, Hebrews 1, 3, Job 38, 33 to 37, Psalm 135, 6 to 7, Colossians 1, 17, Acts 17, 25 to 28, and 2 Peter 3, verse 7. And uh, those verses make it very clear that, uh, you know, everything that we have the ability to do. Gary, do you want to try that next one there? Sure. This is from Ellen White. The power of God is manifest in the beating of the heart, in the action of the lungs, and in the living currents that circulate through the thousands of different channels of the body. We, the nerves, by the way. Oh, and, uh, and arteries and veins and... <laughs> the nerves. <laughs> and the nerves, okay. <laughs> we are indebted debted to him for every moment of existence and for all the comforts of life. The powers and abilities that elevate man above the lower creation are the endowments of the Creator. He loads us with the benefits. We are indebted to Him for the food we eat, the water we drink, the clothes we wear, the air we breathe. Without His special providence, the air would be filled with pestilence and poison. Is that smog? Well, and I mean, again, if you if you listen to TV, uh, the the news, like today again, there was another advertisement. P please get rid of this particular thing because, you know, we found out that there's a poisonous substance in this in this aerosol stuff that you shouldn't be you shouldn't be breathing. So I mean, yeah. <laughs> he is a bounder, bountiful benefactor and preserver the sun which shines upon the earth the glories of all nature the wired the weird the weird solemn radiance of the moon the glories of the firmament firmament mm -hmm. uh, sprinkled with uh, brilliant stars the sh the showers that refresh the land the cause vegetation to flourish, the precious things of nature in all their varied riches, richness, the lofty trees, the shrubs, the plants, the waving grain, the blue sky, the green earth, the changes of day and night, the renewing seasons all spark to man. All speak to man. All speak to man of his created, creator's love. He has linked us to himself by all these tokens in heaven and on earth. Wow. Well, that sounds a lot like America the Beautiful, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. America sound. the Beautiful was written later yeah. than this. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was great. Um, Ellen White wrote that clear back in 1888. September 18 was printed in 1888. That was just a little while before a famous meeting that we know about. 
So why do we believe that Jesus is the greatest gift that God has given? Where would we be if we did not have the plan of salvation confirmed by the life and death of Jesus? One atheist writer, and here's something I mentioned earlier, one atheist writer depicted humans as nothing more than hunks of spoiling flesh on disintegrating bones. Aren't you glad that they talked about you? <laughs> wow. Is that true? Would that be true if we did not have the gospel? Without Jesus Christ, there would be nothing beyond this life, and there would be no reason for God to continue giving us even this life. There was no reason for Jesus to have come the first time if he's not planning to come back. Wow. What examples do we find in the Bible that can help us to understand what God might, what God might expect of us? Jim? From the Bible study guide, <clears throat> the importance of the family in ancient Israel was partly due to the fact that in those days, it was, society of, it was a society of worship. Um, okay. okay. It, uh, in other words, what they, what they say, the ancients, they expected the father of the house to be the worship leader and the priest in the family and the family to worship together. Think about what God's original plan was for Adam and Eve. It was his plan that eventually the Garden of Eden would expand to include the entire livable surface of the, our world where everyone would live in peace and harmony and in love with our Father God. So what plan at, does he... At the yeah. time of the Garden of Eden, wasn't all the surface livable? No. Oh, it, the, the well... The garden was... No, the garden was, but... Fine space. But, uh, Ellen White says, if we had remained faithful and nobody had sinned, right. the garden would be expanded until eventually yeah. would cover the whole earth. Yeah. So, I, yeah. But it it almost sounded knowledge. like you were saying that, that it was, you know, not the oceans and so on. It was not the livable surface. Yeah. In God's foreknowledge, he knew what the boundaries needed to be. He didn't yeah. need any more. Yeah. yeah. So what plan did God have for his church in our day? Carrie? Ephesians 3.10. In order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. I'm a good news Bible. Okay, is it really possible that individuals in the heavenly world might learn about God from our examples? What do you think they could learn about God? What could they learn about God from us? His long-suffering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How he deals with problems, right? Problem children. Yes. Well, we find out what happens when we disconnect from him. Yeah. We would, we would still be living in the Garden of Eden if no one had ever sinned. So what happened? Genesis two fifteen to 17. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree if you do, you will die the same day. Good News Bible. Okay, and that last sentence, part of the sentence there could be translated, you will certainly die. Go ahead. So what is the purpose of that tree of life? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the purpose of that tree of knowledge of good and evil? Did God need to put it in the garden? And if so, why? The tree of knowledge of good and evil was intended to be a protection for Adam and Eve. So long as they did not approach the tree, they would, they would be safe. But if they approached the tree, they would be tempted and tested. So almost everyone thinks that the tree was put there to test. No, God didn't put the tree there to test them. He put the tree there, I mean, he put the tree there because of the great controversy, because Satan demanded it, and because God chooses to be fair. He said, okay. But he also put, used it as the, the, what was supposed to happen. It was supposed to be a protection. God says, it's simple. Satan is limited to that one tree. All you have to do is stay away from that tree. So what do we have now for good and evil? We have the Bible and life. Mm -hmm. So okay. if you have a drunk, you, all he has to do is stay away from the... Um, yeah, the, same thing. The bars. Yep. <laughs> and the home bars. Okay. Home bars. <laughs> you want to, want to read for us that paragraph from Ellen White? My, 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 
thing is misbehaving here a little okay, bit. Okay, yes. Um, the tree of knowledge has been made a test of their obedience and of their love to God. The Lord has seen fit to lay upon them but one prohibition as to the use of all that was in the garden. But if they should disregard his will in this particular, they would incur the guilt of transgression. Satan was not to follow them throughout the garden, I presume. Mm -hmm. that's, Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He could have access to them only from the forbidden tree. Should they attempt to investigate its nature, they would be ex exposed to his wiles. So there's the point. Yes. Satan was not allowed to follow them. All they had to do to, they, they could still be in the Garden of Eden if they had just stayed away from that tree. It's Patriarchs and Prophets. Now, what would be the purpose of even putting the tree there in the first place? Because if it wasn't there, you wouldn't have to worry about anything, right? Freedom. Right. Okay. Freedom. Yeah. Yeah, I know, so but if still says, you can have freedom without it. You need to have it. access. You have to have access to uh, competing ideas. Yeah, you have to have. Well, it, in in a in a universe with a great controversy, you have to have that. Uh, Satan yeah. had already been cast out of heaven. We know that because that's how he came to the garden. So he demanded access to this, and God says, "Well, to be fair, I have to give you access to them, but I limit you to that tree only." I don't know. It seems like to me the the big question is why was Satan and his angels like that? They why did they turn that choose. way? They had freedom to, to listen. That's true, but what made them go away from God? That's, oh, that's, a, that, well, that's an impossible God, question. That's well, an eternal well, question. question. That's the eternal question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, yeah. It, to me, it's just you leave God. Yeah. That's what happens, yeah. and okay. that's what that's what um, is being shown with the great controversy, what yeah. happens when you leave God. Exactly. And well, what Ken has pointed out many times, and that is you separate yourself from the source of life. God doesn't kill you. He just lets the natural things work, work themselves out. Mm -hmm. Things that you have chosen and that you insist upon. Yeah. yeah. There's the consequences of, of God exploit. Uh, explains the physics of how things work, yeah. but if you don't want to listen, he tells you, if he warns you out front what, what will happen, and it doesn't necessarily do it in a way I, I'm going to get you, it's just this is what happens. Well, He's the only source of the people between being crazy and smart, right? Yeah, partly so, by line. Yeah. So, um, all right, if, if God, if you didn't, it just seems to me like, um, when you see the truth, you're going to go to it, no you matter should. what. That's, you but should. if you don't, there's a consequence. Is there something wrong with you that you don't go that way? Well, let me let because me give you an if, example. Because even if you're, even if you're making your own choice, if you make the wrong choice, yeah. that is bad. Are you are you just not smart enough to see that the other way is good? Okay, are you saying you're as smart as God and you should be able no, to no, make those decisions without having God on your side to help you make those decisions? What the, the example Educate I would give you, you Gary, is you a make very the decision, but God educates you. The very I would give you a very simple example: human children, two or three year old, and you say to them, "Don't do that." And you turn your back, and what are they going to try to do? Or probably yes. do it. Or <laughs> probably try to do it. <laughs> yeah, I think you used a very important word in what you were saying there, and that is truth. Yeah. Why did Jesus come here 2,000 years ago, and what was his mission? Tell us the truth. Tell us the truth, but you have to be smart enough to understand the truth. That's why he was... And I, it, to me, it seems like if you don't go the, with the truth, you're not very smart. Yeah, and if that, you're not very smart, right. well, then the whole thing is is pivoting on how smart you are. Yeah, because we chose to rebel against <laughs> God and believe the words of the talking serpent, God had to change to plan B. He sent his son to live that incredible life and die that terrible death for the benefit of the entire universe. Dealing with the scribes and Pharisees in his day must have been a terrible burden and disappointment for Jesus. Ken, I think in that statement for the 
for the benefit of the entire universe is very more the the point of the question how do you show beings that are not human beings mm -hmm. how god deals with problems problems they can they can see what's happened you can see how we've deteriorated how we've uh, how humanity has gotten worse and worse made our choices yeah yeah. He starts what, out with a th thousand year lifespan, and then at the time of the flood, he shortens it down to about 100, 100, 120 years. Yeah. Okay, Myra, I think you're next. Am I next? Okay. Matthew 21. Matthew 21, 33 to 41. Listen to another parable, Jesus said. There was once a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a hole for his wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he let out the vineyard. To, he, then he let out the vineyard. He rented out the vineyard yeah. to tenants, and went on a journey. When the time came to gather the grapes, he sent his slaves to the tenants to receive his share of the harvest. The tenants seized his slave, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, the man sent other slaves more than the first time and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last, he sent his son to them. Surely they will, not, they will respect my son, he said. But the tenants saw the son. They said to themselves, this is the owner's son. Come on, let's kill him and, and we will get his property. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to, the, do to these tenants, Jesus asked. He will surely kill those evil men, they answered. And then the vineyard, let, out, the vineyard. And then, and let. let the vineyard out to other tenants, or rented the, let, is, is that a? It's a rented, a rented. I know, it's but British it's term. a British. For lease, another term okay. for lease. Um, let the vineyard out to other tenants who will give his share of the harvest to the, at the right time. So my question is, how long do you think it took for the scribes and Pharisees to realize that they had just condemned themselves and their ancestors and their nation? <laughs> well, yeah. go ahead. John 14, 1 to 3. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. Good News Bible. I have a friend who says Jesus should have gotten frequent flyer miles. <laughs> <laughs> so in brief outline, what does it mean to be a steward in God, uh, a steward of God in God's family? A, from, this is from our Bible study guide, there are titles that denote the Father's sovereignty. All God's children are His stewards. The family's resources are lent by the Father. And D, the family's treasure is laid, out, laid up in heaven. We know that God is the creator. Without his creative ability, we could not possibly exist. And we have lots of verses for that again. God is our, also our father. And Jim? From the Bible study guide, the father figure is key to the, in the Bible's notion of family. The expression paternal home, ab bet, or excuse, bet ab, points to the patriarchal system wherein the father had full authority over the possessions and family, being their keeper and protector. The father also had the power to judge and decide the fate of many family members. The father was the, the priest, and as a rule, the family and religion were intimately connected. Okay, from that's from a Portuguese commentary. As, far, as part of his sovereignty, one, God is holy, he is king, he is keeper, judge, and savior. He is all wise, all powerful, and all loving. So what do we mean when we say that Jesus is Lord? 
The idea of Lord in the ancient Greek and Hebrew suggests that he owns all things. There is no other Lord, and of course that's Mark 12, 29. Our pathway to understanding God comes through the Holy Spirit. None but those who have the Holy Spirit can understand the Lordship of Christ. The greatest gift that the Holy Spirit has given to us is the Bible. He is the one who inspired the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles to write what we have in the scriptures. He, he, and he has arranged to preserve it for us. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Where are we? Carrie. Carrie. My turn, sorry. I want you to know that no one who is led by God's Spirit can say a curse on Jesus. And no one can confess Jesus is Lord without being guided by the Holy Spirit. So what does God expect of us as his stewards? Can we really somehow manage the Lord's possessions? God expects us to manage his goods individually and collectively. Gordon? From the Bible study guide, the church must exercise stewardship faithfully because God has made her the custodian of material and spiritual blessings. <clears throat> However, the church's stewardship does not replace the responsibility of individual members. The Spirit is the author of faithful stewardship in each believer. The decision to return tithes and offerings generously and regularly is a spiritual work that each believer must experience individually. This faithfulness is a form of religious service that neither prayer nor <coughs> other church activities can replace. Okay. thought that was interesting. That, yes. And from Mrs. White, news instructor, prayer offered ever so often and ever so earnestly will never be accepted by God in the place of our tithe. Prayer will not pay our debts to God. Use instructor, 1898. That's very interesting. So what motivates some human beings to do God's work? And we're not going to have time to redo that one all the way through. So what does God expect from us? To begin with, he requires one-seventh of our time and also one-tenth of our increase. And of course, the verse that we use, we quote about the tithes, especially is Malachi 3, 8. I ask you, is it right for a person to cheat God? Of course not, yet you are cheating me. How you ask in the matter of tithes and offerings? And we'll have to conclude there. If you want to get our handout, you can get it. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we've come now to talk about these issues, very important issues in support of the church and the ministry and spreading the gospel around the world. May we be a part of it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.